So my name is Kate McDonald. I am director of Handheld Press, and we have published today this terrific collection of short stories by Helen Degetti Simpson with an introduction by Melissa. Melissa, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Melissa Edmondson. Um, I specialize in women's supernatural fiction, uh, 19th century, second half of 19th century Victorian period into uh, the 20th century up until around 1950 or so. Um, and this is actually um, my fourth, right? <laughs> right okay, my fourth edition for it Handheld, um, the Women's Weird uh, series, and then um, Eleanor Morden, and, and now it's um, it's Helen Simpson. So um, happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. We also have with us three of Helen Simpson's granddaughters, Kate, Lucy, and Anne. Um, I won't ask them to introduce themselves just now, but maybe later on as the subject dictates or leads you, if either of you, any of you would like to chip in, please do, but that would be really welcome. <clears throat> so I will start with, Melissa, could you give us a potted biography of uh, Helen de Gary Simpson, do you think? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a challenge because she <laughs> she had such a rich, you know, interesting life and, and did so many things and uh, was just amazing at so many different things. Um, I thought it could I, you know, maybe start off with um, a little enter from the, the book. I'd love to read this. And I think this kind of captures it. I wanted to sort of start off with this in the introduction as well. Um, and this is from uh, Corley Clark Rees 1937 um, interview with Helen Simpson. Luckily, uh, she did quite a few interviews and I was able to sort of draw on those um, quite a bit. Uh, but, but this is a, an excerpt from that, and it'll give you just a sense of, of what she was like. Uh, not content with being a first-rate novelist, one of the few Australian writers who have a wide overseas public, she is a biographer, an expert on cookery and home craft, a prominent lecturer and radio talker, an authority on witchcraft, and a talented amateur musician. Such is her interest in world affairs that she reads daily papers in four different languages, French, German, Italian, and Spanish, besides her native English. During the recent troublous times, she has displayed an active interest in the struggles of the workers of the world against fascism. Her physical and mental vitality can only be described as supernormal. Uh, so I think that just that just gives you a little hint of what uh, this person was able to do in her lifetime. But um, she was born in 1897 um, in a suburb of Sydney, Australia, uh, moved to England as a teenager to study at Oxford, uh, left momentarily to um, join the Wrens as a decoder, um, using all those language skills um, to her favor. Um, she um, decided to write her first novel on a bet that no one could write a novel in three weeks and get it published. Um, <laughs> she had an amazing book collection that I would absolutely have loved to see um, of demonology and witchcraft and Elizabethan recipes. Um, she was frequently on the BBC. Um, she lectured um, and just is a person that, you know, I would have loved to have met. Um, and oh, and by, you know, near the end of her life too, she, she died tragically young um, at age 42. Um, she was um, a candidate um, so uh, for parliament as well. So, uh, and, and even in that I'm leaving out so much. So maybe we can touch on a few of those things as we go along. That would be great. Yeah. Can I ask you, yeah, it's, it's very obvious looking at Helen Simpson's um, bibliography, just wait, wading through the, the things that you collected, that an awful lot of her work was historical writing. So it's strange that very few of the short stories that you've collected for this edition, this collection, are historical, yet she really seemed to have preferred writing historical fiction in the long form. Do you, do you have a re any reasons why that might have been so? I know it's, it is really strange because this this is the baseless fabric that was published in 1925 is her only collection of short fiction and it is you know based on the supernatural and then she had the two stories that she wrote 
um, you know, in the, in the late 1930s that have the supernatural content that she did for the popular magazines. But yeah, she mostly wrote um, historical fiction. She was working on um, sort of an epic, a historical epic of Australia uh, when she died. And um, I believe that's, um, I, I think the, the family can correct me on this. I think there might be an unfinished manuscript. Um, but she didn't quite get to finish that. But, but yeah, it, this is such a departure. Her su supernatural stories are such a departure from her historical fiction. And um, it, it's interesting. We can talk about that too, how, you know, they're very much, I think, of their time. They're very modern. And I don't want to get, you know, too much into that because I think we'll talk about it a little bit more. But they seem, like you said, almost out of time mm -hmm. um, in, in certain ways that, that is such a departure from that historical novel that, you know, the majority of her novels, you know, were historical. Yeah. I wonder if it may have been something to do with how they would sell, um, like short stories set in the present day might sell better in the massive uh, short story magazine market, whereas mm -hmm. historical short fiction, maybe not so much. Yeah. And there is always, we've talked about that in, in past, you know, book launches and things as well, where, you know, a lot of authors were sort of, um, you know, they tried to kind of steer them away from short fiction collections because they thought they wouldn't sell as well mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to stick to novels. So yeah, maybe, um, you know, there's, maybe there was some of that where she said, okay, if I do supernatural, you know, but they are so different in their own way as well. They're not, yeah. they're not your typical, and I hesitate to say typical because in the genre, there's not really any typical, but they are so different. Um, and they are to me so modern. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, being written, you know, in between the wars like they were. Yeah, 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 they're not, they, some of them are, are just timeless. It could have been set in any mm -hmm. period whatsoever mm -hmm. um, in the last, 50, you know, 500 years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's focus on these stories in this edition. How did you come to select these stories? Was it just based on the baseless fabric, her own original collection plus adding, or did you just go for the stories and find that you had actually recreated most of the baseless fabric. Luckily, I knew about the baseless fabric um, because of Women's Weird too. when I was working on that edition. Mm -hmm. uh, I sort of stumbled across Helen Simpson's supernatural stories um, in another collection of Australian uh, colonial fiction that had been edited by um, James Doig, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, in Australia. And um, I, I didn't choose that particular story. Um, that was the pledge, actually. That was the first story from Helen Simpson that I found. Mm -hmm. um, and I through that, though, I was able to um, interlibrary loan um, The Baseless oh. Fabric because it is an incredibly rare book. Mm -hmm. um, I had a chance to get one a few years ago and I let it go. And it still, that haunts me that I, 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 I missed out on a copy of that book. Um, but it is incredibly rare. So mm -hmm. I was able to interlibrary loan it and then read the whole collection. And then from the, almost from the very beginning, you know, the first couple of stories, I was just, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never read anything like it before. And, um, you know, luckily you were interested from um, Young Magic that we, mm -hmm. um, I should mention that we published, um, that we went with. Um, so I, I said, you know, the whole collection is just wonderful. Yeah. And then, and then we, we were able to add on those, those other two stories. I wanted to add on those other two stories as well mm -hmm. um, that she published in the, in the late 1930s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Young Magic is, is mm -hmm. extraordinary. We'll come back yeah. to that one. Yeah. Okay. I, when we put the collection together, it was my job to find the title because that's what the publisher does. Um, and it was not, we, yeah, with um, Eleanor Mordaunt's collection, which we put together last for last autumn, mm -hmm. we chose two stories and made them into a title. So we had the villa and the vortex. So we have alliteration and we have a good, a good um, sense of, of slight spookiness. For this one, the, the outcast and the right, both again, quite, quite spooky titles, no alliteration, but we needed something to indicate what these stories were about. And to me, landscape was the overwhelming uh, themed approach, you might, <clears throat> you might say. And I just wonder why does she use landscape quite so much? Um, I mean, it's, do you think it exemplifies a particular kind of uncanniness or supernatural? Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking over, I have my, my copy here. I'm just sort of, you know, looking over the, 
um, the stories themselves. I mean, they're so, how she's using landscape too is so different, you know, in each story. And like you mm -hmm. said, some of them are so timeless. There's really, I was able to pick up Sydney in the pledge. Like oh, I right could tell, here. like that I can tell that that she's describing, I feel like she's describing where she grew up in that story. Um, oh, the other ones, yeah. yeah, the other ones though are just, you know, I, you know, they kind of, like you said, exist sort of out of time. They're different, they're different places. Um, but, you know, it could be, it could be sort of anywhere. And I just, I've always wondered too, if, if some of that sort of, um, that Australian, you know, being born there and, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to, she, she talked about Australia quite a bit, you know, she never sort of lost, you know, that sense of connection, I think, mm -hmm. to, to her homeland. And I wonder if some of that, you know, sort of comes through in these stories as well. Um, yeah. You know, she talks about the family, you know, the family estate and um, wanting to just being struck by the landscape there. So I wonder if this was sort of her way to kind of return, mm -hmm. you know, like in, a, in an imaginative sort of way. Yeah, um, yeah. Th that's one of the things, too, that is sort of the tragedy. Um, in one of the interviews, she mentioned about wanting to retire to the family estate um you know and she never got to that point yeah, but yeah. she always wanted she said i i want to return i want mm -hmm. to return to australia i am really really stunned because honestly i did not pick up at all that the pledge might have been set in australia i, I just feel i feel that yeah. it, i feel that it was yeah it's possible so to recap for those of you who haven't read that, that story yet it's about a long street which ends in a high cliff and it's not on the coast, but the sea is extremely important for the resolution of the story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a very strange, gaunt and slightly forbidding woman who lodges in a house. And the people who own the house are really quite unsettled by her. They think she's odd and strange, and she is odd and strange, but she does very little apart from take walks up to this high cliff and look out towards where the sea might be. And then I won't do any more because there's spoilers, but I have been trying to fit that story into a Cornish or a Devon or a sort of Southwest England setting or possibly Kent because of the high cliffs. It just didn't even occur to me that Australia might have been the place because it's not about the immediate landscape. It's about the far off landscape that only she can see. So you don't get details of plants or a sense of temperature or, or insect sounds, which might pin it down to a particular country. That is a fascinating idea that she was writing Australia in her fiction. The other stories I was really interested in under the heading landscape, well, there's grey sand, white sand, which is the story of a man who is possessed by a landscape, which is really dark. And then there's the man who had great possessions, which is a man who creates a landscape, creates an entire estate for himself with women, with a woman to do with as he likes. And gradually this is taken away from him. Mm -hmm. And then he comes to realize the value of that which he has created, but no longer owns. So possession is key there. But grey sand, white sand, the, the, the absolute horror in that story comes out of the landscape and takes over the man's mind. It's, it's such a strange story. Have you got anything you'd like to say about that, that one? What I feel like is unusual, too. I mean, with the stories, it's, it's hard to really, you know, you can group them you know there's some stories like you said about possession you know there's some stories that are heavily about landscape mm -hmm. you know there's some that we could say are haunted house one of the ways that um she described helen simpson described the collection was um houses which are alive yeah. which i love that description we can come back to maybe too but um but that's such a different story um it's psychological so it fits in you know there's that running thread throughout the collection which I, I just absolutely love mm -hmm. um but it, it's so sort of it's so sort of internal but then you have that landscape that he wants to you know he wants to see something he's an artist right a visual artist he wants to see something but he wants to have a connection with it right you know he wants it to give something to him mm -hmm. back almost like it's a person or for him um, to for him to have something revealed he wants a revelation mm -hmm. and he waits he sits there and waits for a whole day for the revelation yeah. to be given to him by the way the land and the light change 
and then he yeah. goes home and does a dreadful thing. It's it's yeah. oh, the horror. I wonder. And yeah. it's a, yeah, not like you said, not to give too much away, but it's this kind of mental unraveling, you know, that yes. happens in that story, and it's it's just slow and steady. And, mm. you know, you know, something's going to happen, but you don't know what, you know, no. Simpson's always sort of keeping you on your toes like that. Yeah. Um, and, but and yeah, the that, that revelation. Yeah. 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 And the, 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 the narration is done using the, well, the man who is unraveling. It's through his mind. The focalization is through mm. his perspective. So the reader is seeing two things at once. The reader sees what the man thinks is happening. But at the same time, the reader can see quite well what is happening. And the distance between the two perspectives, the rational and the irrational, that is what makes this story so unsettling because you're yeah. in both at once. And it's you say about wanting to see, and she she leaves us, every, you know, she leaves everyone in darkness. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want, again, not to give too much away, but that there's that literal darkness that mm -hmm. she leaves with. And that just, that, that sticks with me as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a horrifying yeah. story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's move on from the really scary one. <laughs> the other one, other aspect of her fiction I really admire is oblique storytelling. And this is something I've absolutely loved ever since I fell in, fell headlong into Rudyard Kipling when I was a teenager. Telling a story with just slight hints and the reader is really forced to do most of the work to work out what is going on. And I think Simpson does this so well. Um, so the outcast is quite good because you have a stranger coming to a pub and he's kept out of the main room until he gets back in and, and then he overhears a conversation which unravels a story but there is just so much missing so not only the narrator but the reader one step removed both have to work out what is going on what has happened with the story of the man, men from the village who went to fight in the war um, that story really strikes me as almost the most kipling-esque of simpson's writings because she does do exactly what kipling does there's several stages of remove um, there's real unpleasantness and chilling at the heart but it's all built up around dialogue dialogue and character revealed through how people talk to each other yeah and i mean that's another landscape i feel like that's another landscape story as well for you know where again it's it's tough not to give too much away but where the soldier is left you yeah. know that becomes so important and then you know the trees in the story mm -hmm. um and not being able to grow you know maybe somewhere else the tree that you know that always that line sticks with me too that maybe the tree would grow there yeah you know yeah. where he actually is because he was never really a part of the community the village right yeah, that he came exactly from so. yeah and then you have an, an extra level of of quite uncanniness when you think well it's a tree not growing and very often in fiction from this period or earlier, a tree is a direct synonym for the cross, the cross that Christ was crucified on. But yet in this story, it's inverted in a most horrible way. So maybe Simpson never meant that, but given, given the culture of the time, the cultural norms of the time in writing about abstracts and, and um, images like this, I would not be surprised if there was something about um, the, the cross on Calvary that was involved in this story some way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then another oblique conversational story as much more land, which is the one I think is her revenge on every single arrogant male undergraduate she had ever had to endure. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you have to really struggle to work out what is going on. And this young man climbs one floor above to get into the haunted room just to find out what's going on. And you, you just, you've got no idea and you're, dependent on his narrative to himself and what is he missing out what is he not telling you it's magnificent I love that story that's one of my I, I can't pick favorites because they're all wonderful but that was one I just absolutely loved I absolutely mm. love that story I love yeah. it again the descriptions um when she and that's one of the excerpts I included from the um in the introduction how she's describing the room and it's like a, a, you know, like a brain, right? You know, and that's the yeah. one place we can't escape. You know, that's the one place you can't escape from. Yeah. And that yeah. it's just this extended study of fear mm -hmm. and how it affects us. And I feel like that, I feel like this is one of the, the shining like representative samples of what she can do like yeah. in this genre, because it's just amazing how it's those impressions, right? You know, he doesn't ever actually see anything, but it's affecting him. Yeah, and that moment yeah. when the candle starts to move 
and there's no good reason. And he can see, he doesn't look at the candle, he can see the candle light shifting. So something, there was an agent in the room and we're all petrified. And then he turns around and my goodness, the bravery. And then he sees what's doing the moving of the candle. Oh, relief, but also, oh my goodness. It's, not that much relief. <laughs> not really, no, but still, there's a rational, there's, there is rational explanation. And that's what causes the partial relief, even though the whole situation is so terrifying. Yes, it's magnificent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then disturbing experience of a very old lady where um, a lady who has become a widow and has decided to buy a grand house that in some oblique way has shamed her. And this is a strange episode because it's told partially in flashbacks. So the old lady who's from the lower middle classes comes with a huge amount of cash from her dead husband's estate to buy this stately home from the extremely rich and landed family. And they're offended, but also quite pleased for the money. And then it unfolds that the reason the old lady would like to buy this is she wants to take control of the house to pay it back because once when she was behaving slightly shamelessly, she spotted the house and felt that the house was observing her. This is on the top of a sharabang, which is such a British class statement because anyone in the 1920s who went for a ride on a sharabang, which is basically an open top, top bus, was cavorting in public, being shameless. And this woman was definitely behaving in a, in a, in a very flirty way, inappropriate for the time and everything else. And then she's observed by the house. So the very idea that a house can observe you and make you feel shame. I do wonder if that was something that mm -hmm. Helen Simpson observed in a, another setting and thought, oh, that's an idea. This idea that the, a house can make you feel that way. What do you think? It could very well be. I mean, she has she had an interest in, in architecture <laughs> among everything yeah. else. I mean, she lived yeah. in again. I found this fascinating interview that, you know, they lived in a, a 200 year old, you know, Queen Anne house. And mm -hmm. and she, you know, talked about that. So, you know, could very well be. And, you know, she lectured and toured throughout, you know, England. Um, so I mean, she could have, she could have definitely found out. But that's another one, you know, that I that would I would classify again as the kind of the haunted house you know mm -hmm. the yeah. more traditional if we want to label something you know that's that's one of the houses which are alive that, that she talked about um but this I read this story and I said this is Shirley Jackson's Hill House before there was Hill House okay. you know yeah. um there you know very rarely I've read so many you know haunted house stories every now and then you get one of those stories where the author is sort of brave enough or creative whatever you want to say to kind of imbue that house with some personality mm -hmm. that that house becomes alive like mm -hmm. Simpson says and I when I read that I said this is one of those stories those special stories where the house is is, is alive mm -hmm. and like I said I thought about that I mean um I thought that's Shirley Jackson that's Hill House mm -hmm. um, and you know the again not to give too much away but the end the last yeah. paragraph of that story and if you if you've read it you know, or when you when you read it, look for it. But the end, I just I think I actually said wow, or, or I said something <laughs> like that when I finished that story for the first time. And I I did that quite a bit throughout the collection. I would just like I would stop and say, oh, that's so good. Like I would actually say it because the yeah. stories were so good. But that one, that that last line, that last mm. line just got me. Um, but you know, that's fascinating too. Is the woman who wants to tear down the you know the internal workings of the house because she can't quite do that with herself right she's yeah. built up this facade that she has to sort of live by and then she's called outside you know without her shoes on and and, and then yeah. she has that moment right you know and then the house you know responds mm -hmm. um, but that again psychological but but it's the house and the woman you know yeah just, yeah I have to say the very thought of this one and um, Tame. Mm, yes. I used to work for English Heritage, which is the British, well, the, then the English mm. body for protecting ruins and archaeology. The very thought of taking a house apart I was going, no, don't do it. Think about the listing. It was oh, dreadful. I couldn't do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there was that other layer of the, the British mm. passion for retaining and conserving the past, mm. no matter what. So to write about it, 
someone actively taking houses apart is mm -hmm. really quite shocking on its own, no matter what supernatural elements may also be present. Mm -hmm. And the person again that's affected that, yeah, those two two stories go so well together. They do, you know, yeah. I, I, they really do. They really mm -hmm. do. I think we have to talk about young magic, which is mm -hmm. I've, I've invented a an entirely new category of fantasy. It's what I call in your face fantasy. When you're writing realistic fiction mm -hmm. and you put a fantasy element in and the characters have to deal with it they have to try and live with the fantasy so you get this intrusion of the supernatural into the realist world and it's a difficult thing to do and young magic when i read it back in gosh it must have been early no late 2018 i think that's when mm -hmm. we started putting the first mm -hmm. women's weird collection together Young Magic for me was one of the top two stories. The other one was um, DK Broster couching at the door, which is devastating. But mm. Young Magic was amazing because a young girl has a secret invisible friend. OK, fine. And then the secret invisible friend turns into a familiar and then she can levitate and she can she can make things happen. By, and it's the effect of this supernatural power on other people. And then what happens when puberty's happened and she's a young girl with adolescent desires? How does this change? And the, the looming terror and horror at the very end of that story is it's like this ghastly dark stain all over the wallpaper. It's, oh, it's just dreadful. But it's one of the most powerful stories, I think, that she wrote. It's incredible. That one really stays with you, too. Like, there's so many of these stories, but that one really did. I mean, from Women's Weird and then, um, you know, having it in this collection again, it's just, I think about it sometimes, you know. And, yeah. you, you know, you, because she's not showing you this Ben's character. She's not showing you what is it, right? Who mm -hmm. is it? Is it? Is it in the house? Is it, you know, is it, is it a part head? of her? Yeah, 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 and that it's such like you said. I'm so glad you said that too. About it's the study of adolescence, mm. you know, and these worlds that you know the the character, the protagonist builds up, but then this character, like you said, it starts off as this imaginary friend. I sometimes I, it's like, how do I describe, you know, what this story is and what it does and yeah. the supernatural yeah. element of it? But yeah, at the end, um, you know, she wanted someone for so long, you know, and now she has it in the real world, maybe. There's some interesting things I think going on with that relationship as well. Yeah, with um, the, she has the with the young yeah. man. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, then we have the kind of the reemergence of this, you know, this entity, <laughs> whatever you want to say it is. And I it's mean, even, I mean, it's so creepy. She describes it like a fairy at some point, which I think is just so creepy, you know, to me yeah, that you know yeah. this this thing is coming back and causing her to do things, you know, mm -hmm. working through her. And then um, Helen Simpson is so good at that like the last paragraph of every story just mm. like it just hits you yeah. and you know you think you might have control of things like as a reader as you go along and then you know at oh, the no. end she's going to do one thing and say no you know no I'm going to get you one more time and then it's just you know <laughs> the the last it's almost like that and I, like I'm just again looking through my my book it's like every mm. story is just the the last last line or last paragraph is just an extra you know, I An think it's just kicker. amazing. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, she knew how to tell stories, no matter what mm -hmm. they were. Mm -hmm. There is a, an awful lot of sadness in these stories. Many of the mm -hmm. characters have suffered loss. Um, and I wonder if she was drawing the, something out mm -hmm. of the emptiness of loss or the gap, the vacant, the vacantness, the hole in the life, which had been which which had produced the sense of sadness. I wonder if that is where the supernatural was falling into. Was the supernatural that's really not expressed very well, but you know what I mean? That, that actually that's interesting. Uh, you know, this idea of sadness. It's not something I I thought a lot about, but that that's interesting that you kind of you, you bring that out. You know, in your reading. But I, now I kind of I, I do see that as sadness or like an incompleteness, maybe. Yeah. You know, well, we in, in in life. We have the pledge with the woman waiting and waiting. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, I mean, lover. that's the one. Yeah, and then like she's waiting. Yeah. And then there's the man who had great possessions. Mm -hmm. There's terrible sadness in that. Um, and it's really difficult to talk about that story without spoiling it irretrievably. So we can't. Mm -hmm. But the two lead characters, they are desperately sad because of what one has done to the other and the other is doing back to him. And then we have a curious story. Now, mm -hmm. oh, that's the one about the theater. 
the theater. Oh, that is dreadfully sad. Yes, the, 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 ghost, yes. the ghost actress. Mm -hmm. My goodness, mm -hmm. she's unhappy. Um, and then and it's loneliness too, right? You know, is, it's, yeah. the, you know, add that it's loneliness too in these yeah. stories. So perhaps something about the longing that sadness produces. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, trying to, you know, trying to have a connection with someone else, you know, again, yes. and just, I mean, that, I think that, that sadness is really an interesting, that's fascinating to think about. And it's making me think about, you know, all these other things like, like loneliness and, mm -hmm. you know, not wanting to kind of face having an kind of a, an emptiness, you know, to your, to your life or making connections and wanting yeah. to have relationships. Cause I think, um, you know, not to give too much away, but, um, you know, um, you know, good company, even that with the possession, we haven't talked a lot about that, but the man who oh, had yeah. great possessions. Yeah. You know, he mm -hmm. has to, it's all in his head. Yeah. You know, again, it, it, that's that happens for so many of the characters. It's all in their head, but it's, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, at the end, or it, it, can, it might not be right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. I think, I think we could throw this open to the floor. I wonder with the Hamilton sisters like to say anything, has anything we've said made any sense or made any connections with your, your memories of what your mother may have said about her mother? Yeah. Absolutely. And also the little bits of reading that we've done. I think one of the really interesting themes that you've talked about is this sort of sense of landscape. But I connect that with her interest in the mind. I think the landscape is quite often a reflection of the mood or mm -hmm. the, sort of the setting for the, the story mm -hmm. is very connected with the way that minds are working. And that's something she was very interested in. A lot of her interest in magic mm -hmm. was about not about the spells themselves. Well, though apparently people used to write to her and ask for spells. Good but one. it was it was about the effect it had on people's thinking the yeah. ability to kind of force things or do something that would create a change that the belief in that would affect people's mood and the way that they looked at things mm -hmm. and that was quite an interesting kind of perspective and I think a lot of this is about how minds work mm -hmm. and, and we've not mentioned the fact that she had a yeah we've not really explored the fact that she owned a collection of books about witchcraft and then she collected the really old ones what happened to the books did her did her husband get rid of them after she died or we don't know where all of them are um we do have a couple i think uh, mm -hmm. but but certainly th there are some missing and there there are yes there may be ways of retrieving a few of them right okay right <laughs> interesting <laughs> that would be great i would love that would be great if you could you know maybe put some of them back together again you know yeah mm -hmm. but that's but it was such a, it was such a, probably a difficult time too, because, you know, she died, it was during the blitz, right? And I got the impression that she was trying to recuperate from mm -hmm. her surgery and she had to be moved maybe too soon. Um, and, you know, just all that, you know, that whole time period, I wonder, you know, if, if some of that was, you know, happening as well. It was very difficult. And, and she had, she went to recuperate outside London because London was such a difficult place to be. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, the surgery hadn't done its job entirely, and I think you know, she she didn't make it, which is desperately sad. Yeah, and it must have been appalling for your grandfather because he was a surgeon, so he would have been better knowledge than most. I know, absolutely. Mm. And he was actually a paediatric surgeon, one of the first, but he, yes, he was, he was devastated by it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's also really interesting what you're saying about sort of bringing in Australia, because I know that they both felt that connection back that, that Dennis, her husband, used to buy eucalyptus leaves and burn them to have the smell of eucalyptus in the house. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a lovely idea. Oh gosh. But, but they both felt very Australian, but they decided to stay in the UK for the First World War. Um, mm -hmm. Having been there in the First World War, the, the Second yes. World War, they were going to stay again. Yeah. Um, so they, it's a, it was a joint decision. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, Anyway, no, I did think that the conversation around that sort of the sense of landscape and mood, for me, that all connects together with how people's minds are working and, and kind of trying to bring that out in a, a sort of more expressive way. Mm -hmm. Which would throw an interesting light on her decision to stand as a member of parliament. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Apparently he campaigned in a pony and trap going, going round <laughs> the doorsteps. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, that, I guess it's very good good for petrol usage in the war. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Lucy and Anne, do you want to contribute something? Is there anything that struck you when we've been talking? Well, it's a really fascinating book and uh, I'm actually getting a lot of listening to you explaining it. You're actually giving me much more insight than I got myself, which is shocking since I'm related. But <laughs> anyway, so thanks for that. It's really helpful. I'm not quite done with it, but I'll get there. Good, good. Um, I'm hoping one day it'll all take off and become um, audio books. Put it all on audio. Oh, Save wow. Me. Yeah. <laughs> we are looking, well, for audio books need a Kickstarter of, of cash that handheld can't quite manage at the moment because we've had a two year pandemic and now we've got a war and cost of living crisis. So money mm. is tight. But yes, audio books are the next thing we want to do. But, mm, brilliant. And, Yes, I think <laughs> having some stories would be outstanding for that. We'll let you know. Yes. We'll let you know, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Anne? Well, then, Melissa, I think you've done an amazing job collating and, and editing. And the only thing I wanted to bring in was uh, that I found, I found oh. a picture of her. Um, so yes, that, <laughs> that's the Dorothy I'll That's Dorothy, that's Dorothy yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, they've both uh, got the Guinness. <laughs> so great! I love that so much. That's fantastic. That's how we know we're all related. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that taken at the at the detection club? Yes, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's terrific. What a great! I love picture. all these pictures I haven't seen before. This is great. <laughs> oh it's my word! Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Right, to those people in the audience, I'm going to change the screen view now so we get everybody. Would anyone like to ask a question by revealing yourself or typing it in the chat? Please, please do. We have experts here willing to talk to you. We've had a couple of comments. Um, yes. Tracy's saying that she loved grey sand and white sand. I think there's a reason why we chose it as the opening story. And it's interesting, some of the reviewers who've already reviewed the book, they haven't quite liked the stories. They've been puzzled. I think they expected more weird, more mm -hmm. extreme horror. I don't know why, but Grey Sand and White Sand flummox several people. She's so. modern. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I think, I think a lot of times, you know, the Victorian period just overwhelmed the genre, right? Yeah. And, you know, you go in wanting a neat kind of ghost story, maybe doesn't have, you know, a neat ending, you know, a tied up ending is what I mean by that. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, these are modern and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, you know, they were described as um, reviewers, contemporary reviewers said, you know, she's she's evasive and she's elusive. And they meant that in the best possible way. Yeah. And yeah. Um, one of the um, one of the reviews that we have coming up, I won't I won't mention his name. I think we know who that is, but he actually loved gray sand and white sand. And I'm so glad someone else said that too, because that's good. Um, yeah. It you know it can be a bit of a challenge, but if you want to be challenged, um, you know that's you know that they're perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. she does make you work. It's un undeniable, and my word, the rewards mm -hmm. are terrific. It is. We have yeah. we have a question, um, Louise would like to say, I'd, I'd be interested to know whether Helen Simpson corresponded with any other contemporary authors of what we now call weird fiction in her time. So whew, who, uh, who would that be? E.F. Benson, I suppose, Arthur, Arthur Macken? It's difficult. I mean, is there any extant correspondence, Kate, that you know about? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of specifically in this mm -hmm. genre, although I think you had a, a story of Margaret Kennedy's in the Women's Weird collection is that right we published margaret kennedy's memoir where it stands in the 20th century which yeah. features your mother it does as a, as a, yeah. as a, as a young girl but we yeah. haven't published any short fiction by kennedy no okay. no i okay. but they were very great friends so yes. uh, yeah there's a lot of communication between them but she also was a very good friend with dorothy mm -hmm. sort of yeah. stories about the pair of them together um i don't know about the specifically in this category of fiction because she crossed so many boundaries Mm -hmm. um, she had lots of different relationships but um, we should have a dig into the correspondence because I have got some that hasn't been gone through yeah. well and good huh. friends with Clements Day yeah. <laughs> the namesake oh, yeah. right the namesake yeah, yeah. but um, yeah. you know again detect more detective it seems like we're kind of we're more detective mystery yes you know fiction uh, but I don't I don't know I don't know about you know that'd be interesting to to come up with if you know she did mm -hmm. correspond with any you know ghost supernatural authors 
I know she wrote to Walter Delamere. I know that he wrote to her. Okay. So he might, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Count as a supernatural writer occasionally. He is almost. Or he's certainly yeah. The um. The Midget is a very, very strange novel. Um, yeah, he wrote. Yeah, he wrote supernatural fiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, please do if you find anything interesting in the correspondence, we would love to know. Mm -hmm. That would be quite good. We have a question from Sean. Are there plans to republish any more of Helen's works, Cups, Wands, and Swords, or The Woman on the Beast, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, well, I've had a go at reading both, and I felt I could not see either of those two novels selling. Um, there are elements in them that make them, huh, well, some of the language, because it was of its period, there is some um, use, use of racial stereotypes, which was simply what everybody used at the time. Mm -hmm. so it's not so much a slur on her character as of, of the period. And one of those novels, I forget which, there's simply too much of it to make it publishable now. You'd have to do an awful lot of editing, and that just doesn't seem right. Um, the Woman on the Beast is a strange novel because it's in quite different segments which don't have a lot of relationship to each other mm -hmm. from what I remember. And I just remember thinking, I cannot see this selling. It's, mm -hmm. it's very experimental, but not, not in a sort of stridently modernist way, which might make it marketable in a sort of bizarre way. So I'm sorry, Sean, personally, I don't feel that I would want to republish either of those two. I tried Boomerang as well, which is the one that got the big prize. And I think it's a historical novel, isn't it? It's the one with a, a sweep of history from France mm -hmm. to Australia. Semi-autobiographical that, because her it yeah. starts in France where her family came from, goes by Australia where her family moved to, mm -hmm. and then comes back to meeting a man in the trenches of the First World War, where actually that's probably where she met her grandfather, because she was, in France some of the mm. time doing translation and um had a had a military passport yeah um, the truck yeah from a commercial perspective if it's one can publish historical fiction but publishing classic historical fiction when it's fiction that was written as historical over a hundred years ago so yes. it's 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 very difficult to sell it would have to be written by an existing big name so the big nameless would help bring the buyers but yeah. for someone who is as relatively unknown as Simpson I would not risk it it's mm -hmm. um yeah it's difficult it is. yeah can I ask a yes. question please thank do you. it's uh, my name is Janet um first of all thank you very much for um doing all these these talks I've actually been to quite a few now and um I started buying some of the books Great. Uh, so th so thank you Kate but I've got a question for Melissa and also for the Hamilton sisters Mm -hmm. and, and that is that I'm, that I'm very interested um, in a scholarly way about um, occult London uh, in particular at, at, at this sort of time. And I'm wondering whether um, Helen was a member of any societies or knew any other people who were involved in that, that sort of um, that those groups. I'm very aware that all, that all kinds of writers um, kind of overlapped and they also overlapped with a lot of Freudian psychotherapists, or Jungian psychotherapists. London was quite a quite a centre, um, certainly between the wars. So I'm just wondering whether um, whether there was any connection. You've sort of talked about writers, but but certainly with um, psychotherapists, uh, Freudian uh, analysts, these kinds of people, and also whether she belonged to any societies of that kind, apart from the Detection Club, presumably. <laughs> I'm not aware of any specifically occult societies, but I will ask my mother if she remembers anything about that. Happily, um, let's see if we can find anything out. Yeah, I didn't come across anything specifically, you know, in my readings and, and research and all. Yeah. Yes, you might be better looking in biographies or studies of people who were known to be in occult societies and seeing if Helen Simpson's name popped up. That might be a a mm -hmm. sort of, sort of cross-cutting mm -hmm. way of trying to track her down. You know, very often the in indexes are a really helpful clue. If you've got a proper index there, everybody gets indexed. And it's amazing what traces people leave. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, can't help you with that, I think. Uh, actually, I've also just thought I might ask um, Geraldine Beskin in the Atlantis bookshop because her family has owned the bookshop um, for quite a long time now. So um, that might be another way of 
trying to find out. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway. That's a good thought. Yes. Want to see more from us? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to click like, subscribe or new content alert.